<laughs> Milton Erickson used to, to give around a, a double card in his groups and on the first uh, sheet there was a shore and the sky with stars and a naked young child, I don't know whether it was a boy or a girl, and looking up to the stars and there was written and when you be aware of how endless the universe is and how huge, is it then the case that you feel so small and meaningless? And when you opened it, there was written, me not either. <laughs> Did you understand? Me not either. Me not either. Do you then feel small and important and unimportant? And when you opened it, me not either. <laughs> So we are good in time, um, from the lecture part we have two chapters left, this one are some small pieces on personality, and a, a bigger part is TA and professional approach. I did uh, make already many comments directing into this direction, but, and we can go through it uh, more systematically. For example, the Toblerone model, a model for supervision, and things like that. Um, and it might, we have now left two and a half hours altogether, so it might be when we are quite quick that to the one or the other small personality model, we can do a short conversation or maybe a real organizational question, uh, doing a half hour conversation on that. But I start with the four pieces of the personality and then we see where we are. Um, concerning to intuition, uh, and I said uh, systemic TA is also meaning culture. Uh, systemic didactic. And so the, what kind of models uh, we develop and how we tie them to each other is part of this um, experimental design. So we usually do not have models that have more than three or four co components because um, training intuition also means to give you an understanding of a model that is pointing to something and if this is too complicated, it will not go down to your intuition. And one of the benefits of TA certainly was that simple models, so they were elicited by situations because of similarity in meaning of models and of the situation. And we kept this basic idea to have simple models, but many, and we also stick to the idea not to make a big consistent system out of it, but scientifically, scientifically spoken, make a catalog or spotlights. Each um, concept is a kind of spotlight and it is interesting if you have a situation, um, it reminds you of a spotlight, let's say, of the three worlds model. And then, and intuitively, the, the model is activated in your brain. So the activation of theory is part of intuitive training. And for that, the models must be simple and not have more than four components or so. And it's not necessary that these, the, uh, the relationship between the concepts is totally clear because it's not one system, but they can be combined. So you switch on the reverse model and you switch on limits to intuition and then you look how does the situation look in the light of these two concepts. 
And when you find that activating the reverse model doesn't, doesn't give you a dif the difference that makes a difference for what you want to achieve, you switch it off. And, uh, and maybe you have an idea to switch another of the models on and see what you see now. So we are also experimental in the way we construct models and we tie models together and we use models in training. And now we have uh, four small models and I all in, in the announcement I almost said everything about these models and but I will repeat it. So when are uh, the drivers? I don't know how you train or be trained in drivers right now. TBK classically uh, try to do it scientifically, um, defining behavioral criteria and all these things. In my experience with that is that people are not well trained uh, when they have only the superficial clues. If somebody says, I tried hard, they say, oh, it's dry hard. But it's, it must <laughs> not, but not be a dry hard uh, because the dynamic is not dry hard. So I never trained people in uh, drivers by training them into uh, uh, objective observing categories. I always train them by playing uh, the drivers so that they get a feel the personal, personality dynamic and feel this smell of reality that comes into this situation when I uh, show you how drivers work. Um, I know some people are not strong enough really to stand uh, to be confronted with drivers, but there's a scare, but if you're really a good professional, you can stand to be confronted with drivers. Then I go back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we can study how that feels, what changed in the atmosphere, what kind of reality in the background was activated. And so you get a sense of driver and not um, calling number, uh, counting numbers and finding out, ah, this must be a driver. Because each driver is a style, brings a style, an atmosphere of reality with it. And as I told you, this is only uh, to, to, to mention how we train. So, and um, we do not uh, explain all the TA ideas about developmental backgrounds of driver development. And it's not imp because it's a functional model, it's not important, the biography. Sometimes it might be when it makes a difference to your focus, but not habitually. And I found uh, that uh, there have been states that also brought in an atmosphere, what I've at first glance thought these are new drivers. But after a while I came to the conclusions that say, they are counter dynamics to the known drivers. And this is, I try to put words to that, is be perfect. You might meet a person who is saying, I don't care, doesn't matter. And then you feel invited to say, oh, you should a bit, at least a, try to be a bit perfect. And say, you immediately respond to the driver the person is opposing to by living a counter dynamic. But, and it's good to have the idea that the be perfect counter uh, driver is behind that. Otherwise you would uh, uh, tune into an atmosphere of active be perfect driver against counter dynamic of be perfect driver and you will certainly um, support the driver dynamic within the person because the person this is one way you can have assumption of, about that has uh, so high expectations that it feels there's no way to get there and the best way to feel comfortable is to tell herself, 
I don't care. But she only doesn't care because she has so high standards that she doesn't even dare to try to fight mm. to reach these standards. And that's, that's be perfect. I have a, an example of that. Mm -hmm. When I when I was younger, I used to manage pubs. Mm -hmm. And when you're managing the pubs, you have to keep it really clean, especially with all the beer spilling. Yeah, yeah. And especially in the summer with the, the potential for flies. And, and so I used to get the team to clean the the beer um, in the cracks that sometimes fall in the, the counters yeah. in the wood. Yeah. And then you have to really clean in the side, the frames of the glass, etc. And at home, so that was really, even getting cocktail sticks, tiny little sticks to scrape it out. At home, I couldn't live up to those standards, <laughs> so I just didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> so I eventually got a cleaner, because I realised the house needed cleaning yeah, okay. on a regular so, basis. So this was but your... if I did it, I'd go into too much detail. Mm. Didn't want it. Mm. Okay. But because... If you would have tried to, you would have done it, overdone it. Overdone it, too much detail. Right. Yeah. Good example. Yeah. And uh, you meet the driver, uh, be perfect driver dynamic, by in, uh, inviting, uh, uh, appreciating that the person has high standards. I always do that at first, that I appreciate that. If you only say, oh, don't take it so serious, you're inviting the person into the counter dynamic, not into the letting go the, the driver. Appreciating and and um, sharing with the person that it's really uh, a fate that wherever you look, you immediately see what's not what's missing. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you have a problem, and it's not your fault. And it's okay to have a specific sense for perfectionism, but it's okay to learn not to make. Uh, the hell of it for yourself or for others. And so they f feel appreciated in, in the value behind. And then it's okay, so let's, let's see how we can find a way in between because this will help the standards you are uh, obliged to the most. So you, to so use the uh, obligation to high standards uh, as a motivation to learn not to be in the be perfect driver, but still being oriented to be perfect. So, and I, I didn't blend this. I just wanted to, to, to give you examples how we taught drivers and how we think about the dynamics of driver. And you can do all this without biographical uh, analysis. Do you also think about it, Bernd, in terms of the counter-transferential response? Do you also think about it in terms of counter-transferential response? So, for example, if somebody is exhibiting I don't care, let's say Esther is saying I yes. don't care, I will start feeling agitated about perfection. Mm. I wouldn't state it in words of transference, but she, uh, but she is certainly introducing a be perfect relationship dynamic. Mm. Whether this has something to do with 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 uh, biographical history, I don't know. But in the here and now, I might experience that. In yes, the yes, it 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 um, it invites into a specific style of dealing with reality. Yeah. And if you don't think about it, then you, you take the role of, of the active part and the other person takes the role of the counter dynamic, but you are both in a perfect reality. And you have to get out of, the, of this uh, kind of reality. And Probably it's, it's the same with uh, be strong dynamic. Uh, in order not to fight and be nice, be strong people uh, sometimes uh, find it easy to say, you can do everything with me. So they let things do to them that they usually would like to fight. But if they would fight them, 
they only have such a, a unrelated and hurting program to fight it and strenuous program to fight it that they do not want to go into, into the dynamic and the, uh, in order to be free from the dynamics, they go to the counter dynamic and not are free from the logic of we have to be strong or weak. That's a, an important criterion for for the style or the mood of reality. And if you have somebody who is offering to let you do anything with hi, with him or her, if you then say, oh, you should stand up for yourself and so. On. You invite the person in her frame of reference of active, be strong. And that's not a solution for the person, so you're creating some kind of a dilemma. And you have to step back and show how this is a, are two sides of the same logic of reality that you can get out on a meta level of the dynamic. And that's the same as please you. Some people come along nasty. And very nice people, if they are un, uh, feel unobserved or just lose control, can be very nasty. And this is the counter dynamic. So I'm fed up with being please. And uh, I try to somehow be different and they go just on the opposite so i always say to fall to fall down on, on the other side of the horse is not riding <laughs> <laughs> but if you tell such a person oh you are quite nasty could you be a, a bit pleasing to people it would be easier so the same logic as we already said and that's the same with dry heart some try hard people try to uh, to adopt an attitude of easy going. Never mind. And it takes uh, it takes uh, a new idea to believe this. This is try hard. The counter dynamic doesn't reveal that very easily. But certainly you feel invited to have the idea this person should be try a bit more. And if you say this, you're wondering why this person doesn't like it at all. Certainly it doesn't function because the, per the person chooses the counter dynamic before, because the active dynamics feels less comfortable for her. But it's there. The definition of the situation is de defined by please you. She only drives to organize herself in defense of. And that's the same with hurry up. Some people just say, oh, we have all time we need. Also, it's not true. In order to defend against becoming too upset. And very often you have people who freeze and you, do, uh, and you would not assume that there's a hurry up behind. In, in some clinics, they found out that uh, there are people who are very calm at the surface, but if you, you look at the um, cortisol level and all that stress factors in turn, they are on a high stress factor. I believe this, uh, this is a way to describe what I mean with counter dynamic. So it's no solution uh, to make these people active. It's important to find out why these people combine activity with hurry up and with exhausting, self-exhausting procedures. And only if you reframe this and, and they have an idea how the world could be different. And if they give up freezing, this would not mean living in a hurry up world, then you, they can be invited to challenge this frame of reference. So it sounds like you're saying that in classical TA, we're taught that drivers are observable. And what you're saying is that it's a relational dynamic. Yes. And that 
in working with it to stay okay, we have to helicopter above and observe the pattern and talk about the pattern whilst embracing our own experience of the pattern. Yes. Rather than talk about stuff we're observing in yes. another person. And the, the, the obvious observation doesn't, if you don't have a concept behind, doesn't tell you that freezing is, might be a way of being in hurry up. Yeah. You, you need a concept uh, to make, yeah. to make the assumption that this can be the case and then you have to go different ways as if you think this person is just frozen by fear or whatever. So it sounds like you're saying the relationship contains, is likely to contain both sides of the dynamic. Yes, yes. And so whichever one you experience, it's yes. still the same. Yes. yes. I try to find out what the logic of the reality is that is brought in by the behavior and not the role the person is actually taken in, within that reality. Mm -hmm. Because the reality has to be changed, not the roles within the reality. My guess is the dynamic that you just mentioned there, Helen, can also happen within an organization. So Certainly. this idea of um, senior people in the organization saying, we need to move this organization on, we need to speed up our, our work, we need to speed up mm -hmm. our progress, mm -hmm. and other people in the organization resisting that. Yeah. Yeah, good that you say this because I tuned into to making examples from individuals. Certainly all our concepts can be applicated on individual level, on team level and on organizational level. And you do not have to change concepts when you change yeah. levels to observe. Yeah. This is one other good criterion for our strategy to develop concepts. So when there's this conflict in an organization, it may be possible some of this is going on. Yes. yes. Uh, if you have to change concepts when you go away from the person to the organization, you never know, never know what you lose. Yeah. If you stay with the same concept and have the same questions and try the same kind of answers, then it's easier to connect the organizational description with the individual description. So this was one of the four small pieces. Yeah, you, you nod as if something came over. Mm -hmm. This is new to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. The counter dynamic is new, mm -hmm. not, not the drivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about Burns' model of culture. I'm thinking out loud here, but I'm wondering if this could be contained in, in, the, in the etiquette and techniques and then the counter dynamic emerging character because one of the organizations I'm working with is very very try hard mm -hmm. it culturally mm -hmm. and in the etiquette that the etiquette of the organization and the techniques is all about setting up mechanisms by which you then can't get where you're going Yes. Because you never get there, because you're always measuring yes, yes. things that are made up. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, what I experience working in the organization is... Is it going to the counter dynamic? Um, yes. Right. Yeah. Oh, and it's good that you mentioned that, because certainly it's not only a psychological dynamic that creates these realities further and further, because these dynamics become structures and procedures and cultural yes. rules and and new individuals are socialized by these cultures and rules and structures to learn to be in a dry heart world. It becomes the mindset and the behavior of the yes. organization. Yeah. I would see it from what you're describing, the techniques are trying hard and the dynamics are easygoing. And the character would be something else, it would be whatever's underneath them. Don't succeed properly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So you can see the TA organisations have a lot of bureaucracy. That's the try hard side. Mm. They're like, the TA, bring your child, it's all very easy going. Yes. But there's a real don't succeed. Yeah. And, and uh, behind the try hard is um, losing confidence that we, you can make it. And the more you go like this, is this confidence is not illusionary, it's becoming going to become real. 
And so it's not a racket, it's a, it's a racket and a perception. And echoing your comment at the beginning, I love the simplicity of it. Mm-hmm. It's really simple to hold and understand. Okay. You see, even the person who is thinking so complicated than I do can bring, come up with simple ideas. <laughs> okay. This was uh, working with identity beliefs. Ah, I've mentioned here that it came up to my idea when I tried to somehow deal with the third degree impasse of Bob and Mary Goulding, they just say it's about being. There's not much more theory around that, but somehow they made a differentiation between a, a being level and a doing level. And this concept is based especially on this differentiation. Um, I give you an example from professional training. There are sometimes uh, people, when I ask them how they are doing professionally, they explain themselves who they are, how they are, in a way that I think, oh, there's still a, a, a long way to go. Then I, but at the same time, I see them acting much more competent. And instead of saying, okay, we have to do much more behavioral training, I ask them, how come that your self-description is much behind your level of competence? And we work with the difference of self-description and competence and do not tune into the mistakes a person does itself, that she will be uh, more better when she learns more, unless this is leading to a change in self-description and, and identity beliefs about oneself. And so, for example, you can come to the conclusion that somebody, for example, comes from the psychotherapeutic field and says, I'm a psychotherapist. That's a decision about identity belief. And also this person works in the organizational field since years and learns a lot about it, never feels like I'm an organizational transactional analyst. And comes to you to train more in order someday to feel like that. But the reason why the person doesn't feel like that is not because it doesn't have the competence, it's because he doesn't change his belief about his professional identity. Then we have to work on the belief on his professional identity. And identity organizes um, competence, and identity also organizes power fields you intuitively bring to in a room. And you might uh, bring in a power field because of your competencies. This person, this example I, I produced, that you are because they they feel you know much about organizations and you stimulate others to learn about organizations. But still you would not hire that person because there is an irritation. You are wondering how comes that a person who is a psychotherapist can be so competent as an organizational consultant. And you do not detect that, uh, that the, the problem is that the identity creates a different world in you than the observed and experienced behavior. And you certainly it would be good then if you if you have a, a prof, uh, you you buy from a professional who is in that problem, you ask them what do you need to, to change to define yourself as organizational consultant and give up your only identity as psychotherapist. And they usually think uh, it will come by itself when I have learned more. And this, this is sometimes true, but very often not. It's a question of redefining her, their identity, and then we work with the flyer idea. Rewrite your flyer. And we do it as long 
as as a person needs not to learn something more, but to reframe it in the connection to identity. And identity beliefs are usually adopted or just are not changed because it, somehow I don't know why the person the, the identity doesn't change or grow automatically with good experiences and then you have to help a bit on that usually it, it happens naturally because others adopt the new identity labels and tell the person I see in your organizational consultant and so slowly the person yes. integrates a new identity belief and slowly let go the the only one else. That's a normal process. If that takes place, you don't have to have any help by consultancy. How do you link identity belief with friend reference? Identity belief is a part of the frame of reference. Yeah. yeah. How 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 I look at, at myself, what I'm really am. And that's the question of quality of being. And this was the origin of the Goulding concept. Say a little bit more about power. What's, what's, how do you understand power? Power? You talk about power fields. Oh no, I'm, with power field I mean um, creating a field of um, an atmosphere and reality. N not power in the sense of one is influencing someone else. Kraftfeld of Ch in German, maybe it's a wrong translation. I think you have some good words in German for something. Kraft really it's a feel, it. I bring in, by my identity, intuitively I create a feel that sorts, uh, invites and organizes kinds of power uh, streams. Energy. Yeah, whatever, it's all a meta metaphor. Mm -hmm. Just somehow somehow stimulates a, a, a style of reality. Mm. Can I just check something? What I heard you saying when you, you mentioned um, that it's about talking to somebody to help them understand what do they need to shift in their belief about themselves to enable them to think that they're, to believe that they're... Yeah, that's, that's what's, what I want to explain next. Oh, okay. My, I was just going to see if I could just check something that I understand yeah. first. Or for example, I have a person, I, I make an uh, individual example, but you can also transfer it to organization. The person um, has somehow adopted the, I, the belief, I'm a mess. And this person believes, maybe because of childhood experience or whatever, uh, I'm a mess. Then the person learns to do things properly and in order and not to stir up everybody and every, every situation. And if she's successful with that, she is a quite good organized mess. She still feels as a mess and the way she tries not to be a mess is like the counter dynamic in uh, the drivers, always a position to avoid to uh, to to stay to stay a mess and to be detected as a mess or produced reality as a mess does. And either she is producing a mess or not producing a mess, she still believes I am a mess. And because she, as long as she believes that, she is either behaving like a mess, introducing other people in messy situation, or doing exhausting work not to be that, like that. And if I have somebody like this in the consultation, uh, I say, Is, you believe you are a mess? Is that correct? It's like a um, not changeable attribute in your passport. Yeah, it feels like that. Okay, I don't know who has written this in your passport. Maybe yourself as a conclusion 
of interpreting your character and your destiny. But I suppose it's wrong. But as long as you believe it, no wonder you behave like a mess. Or if you do not behave, it's not authentic, because people experience that you try to behave fine, not to be a mess. And intuitively, the idea of mess, 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 is in there because intuitively they, they read your uh, mistaken belief about your identity and this creates reality. And are you willing with me to experiment with, with changing your identity belief? Um, I came to that by, through the term identity card. So, uh, if uh, you are a mess is a negative version of potentialities and characters that are yours, what would, would be a positive uh, notion of that? And then we discuss it and take the best we find uh, and say, okay, if we find later a better one, we can exchange it. Must be the right. But how is it a uh, thing... Um, you are um, somebody who is inviting into responsible discomfort, for example. I don't, right now, it's not a short word coming to my mind. We, we work on something, so like a, a, the function a, a clown has, professional... Uh, we need something positive. I don't find the word now, as I say. But we we talk back and forth until we have something. I feel, okay, the soul would at least take this word as a step to developing a new self-definition. And that is antithetic to the mass self-definition. And then I take uh, her identity card and said, do you authorize me to be the authority to change that? And then I uh, wipe it out, write a new one, put a stamp on it, and give it back. And then the person asked me, and what ha have I now to do then? Said, Nothing. <laughs> you can, you certainly will bring up messy situations because it's a habit you, you developed. But you know now that you are, <laughs> it's you are a creating person, creative person, who are, is doing a mess. That's not what really fits her, but that's what she used, learned to do. It will no longer support your identity belief to be a mess. And if you are not doing, uh, bringing up messy things, then you, are, you do what you are. And and, they, and you think this helps? It's just exchanging definitions? I know it, it can help. And very often people, after years of psychotherapy, it only needed this to change this, uh, the development. So all of us hope that we can find some, somehow that our problems have to do with self-definition, because then it's easy. Did you understand that? Yes. This was a joke. Yeah. Please laugh. <laughs> 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 okay. I was just thinking, um, what if, as part of that process, you experience resistance from... That person. One, one lot. As part of the process that you've just been describing, yes. that you experience resistance from that person. I'm thinking of a client who I really, this is really oh. helpful actually, yeah. and it is about her, you know, redefining her identity, but she resists. Yeah, I do not I use the word resistance, the word resistance. Marcel Vinipol. Palazzoli said to 1,000 psychoanalysts, do you know what resistance is? It's the dampness of the psychotherapist. Dampness? 
it's a it being dumb. The dumbness. The dumbness of the psychotherapist. This is resisting. The dumbness. <laughs> the dumbness. of the psychotherapist. So, if there, if there is the person, uh, someone cannot go along with the positive ideas, and we just did not yet uh, respect something that has to come into the picture to understand. Something is, when we only do this simple solutions, then something is not take, taken care of. And then I just ask the person what, do, what is not taken care of. Maybe we do not find out right now, then we can say, okay, it, uh, can we do the contract that later on we will take care of that? This doesn't mean that you now are not allowed to have any more problems around this topic. And say, okay, let's experiment with it. And next time we see, we, we check where we are, and maybe we rearrange the whole thing because it was a beginning, but not, not yet the solution. We are a learning community, and we can, from step to step, learn more and change things. No problem. I was wondering um, how this fits. There seems a correlation here between shifting or redefining identity beliefs and um, helping people when they become fixated on roles. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, or do you, is there no link? It, um, I refer to what I said earlier. I do not, usually I, I'm not going into these discussions, uh, because this would mind, I'm I don't care much whether the role concept and how the identity concept is logically tied to each other. What I do is let's look, see it in the in the light of the role con fixation concept, and then switch to the light of identity concept and see whether we see something different. And we work with the difference that makes, and do not think much about how these two concepts are related to each other. We would have a maybe it's theoretically possible, but it's not very much interesting for you. For me, yeah. <laughs> Actually, you can be interested in <laughs> when I'm 65. <laughs> right. So, did you grasp this idea about identity belief? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really very often makes a difference to uh, and a relieving difference to the ordinary way of how people try to become somebody different. Who was it that said about the dumbness of the therapist? <laughs> Mara Selvini Palazzoli. So, <laughs> yeah, great, got that. Mara, yeah, yeah. So two first names, Mara yeah. Selvini, S-E-L-V-I-N-N-I, -N Palazzola, P A L A double. That Palazzola, the Milan group of uh, system family therapy. She's founder of the Milan group of uh, systems family therapy. She was a a, a, a type of person like Jackie Schiff. <laughs> That's why she, Jackie could also uh, have told thousands of psychoanalysts <laughs> that you're <a> dumbness. <laughs> <laughs> And if you love to work with resistance, is if you love to work with your dumbness. <laughs> but I know that uh, this uh, definition of resistance is not a psychoanalytical one. No, Resistance no. means uh, reaction from the frame of reference of the patient. And to analyze resistance does not mean to do something that the person is no longer defending against influence, but a means to understand how the frame of reference and the dynamic within a person is that the person cannot uh, connect to the reality as other people invite the person to. That's, that's a classical resistance. But usually we use the word resistant when the person is, doesn't agree to how we want them to be influenced. But that's not a technical psychoanalytic term. I suppose I've, I've heard it in Gestalt. Yes. Resistance. Yeah. 
So they borrowed it from yeah. psychoanalysis, yeah. Like, like all the humanistic psychologists did. Yeah. Okay, the third piece of personality work is um, that we have, it goes back somehow to Martin Buber, uh, and, uh, but it's not the same as IU theory of Martin Buber. It also goes back to Viktor Frankl, logo therapy. I've made a very simple, superficial, but practically enough concept of it. Just stating there are people when they want to have uh, good relationships, uh, they first want to settle that common shared reality by building up an IU relationship. You should be interested in me and I'm interested in you, and when we find each other on that, then we can talk about what we are interested in. And if I'm interested in you, I probably am interested in what you are interested in. And if you're interested in me, then that's a basis that you can be interested in what interests me. So the first preference is the IU dimension of good relationship. This is the one part of the world. And there's another part of the world that I feel so uh, when I want to have a good relationship, I look in what people are interested in. And when I'm interested in what you are interested in, or you are interested in something I'm interested too, or I can be interested in what you are interested too, in the way you are interested, and you are interested in what I am interested in. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> well, <Yeah>. I... Then <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in meeting you, and it's okay when I like you, but it's not the most important thing. I'm not so much interested in you, but in your relationship to what you are going to do and are interested in. And this is a good relationship for me. That's the I, it, preference in relationships. Now, uh, because it's one side of the world, it's very often that the I, you type and the I, it type marry. <laughs> And the IU type said marrying means that you love me. The I it type means marrying means that we I'm interested in your way of being in the world and what's interesting you. When I lose connection with what you are interested in, um, then I have problems to feel we have a good relationship. Then I want to talk with you about are we still interested in the same thing? And the I, you type uh, thinks we have married to be, to love each other, and if this is clear, then we can be interested in something. Mm. Now I feel you do not love me anymore. Uh, and then I will not talk with you about what we could be interested in unless the I, you level mm. is renewed. And the I, it person, if she or he dares to say to her, the I, you level, uh, I will not invest into that unless we have something that we can then do together, are interested in. And uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings in the nature of the other, and after one while they are in polarity. The one is saying, you are only misusing me, you never loved me, I only should be a, 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 a mean to reach your goals. That's not love, you are cruel, and whatever. You wouldn't have experienced this by any chance. No, <laughs> never. And the other person is saying, you always want to be close to me, that's so boring, it's so tight, I want to do something in the world, I want to create reality, and you you do not even tell me what you're interested in, and you do not share my interests, how could we be a good couple then? 
And so it's a, going into the extremes, and certainly each of them in their frame of reference does not see any way how we could find each other, because it's like Israeli and the Palestinians. So the premises for meeting again are so different and are polarized. And this concept then helps very much uh, really to understand and accept that the other person is just different, doesn't mean less interested in close relationships, intensive relationships, but has other priorities in building it up <coughs> and rebuilding it and fi fixing it again when there is a disruption. Say, so I as a IU person uh, need some distance from my preference to understand that the, the other type, that's his way he wants to share reality in a loving way with me. And so it's a concept against the uh, mental imperialism, imperialism of relationships. Mm. Oh. So how do you use this in an organizational context? Oh yeah, I, uh, I do it, for example, uh, I have a, a, a the, one of the biggest German companies had had two heads, and they have been seized two times. And all their struggles with each other could be uh, quite plausibly seen in that light. Mm -hmm. And I explained that to, to them, and they said, oh God, that's just true. And now we understand, if we get into a conflict, how we Besides that we are, have different opinions how to proceed, we polarize in styles. So that we both do something that we are incapacitated to deal with the content differences because we polarize in styles and then communication is not possible and we do not even know how to reapproach again. It had a tremendous, um, impact. And you can try uh, in merging organizations uh, try to, to use that concept where they explain something. For example, in Germany we had a, a merger of Hypobank and Vereinsbank, two, two big bank houses. And the Hypobank was very relational. It was an important part of the culture uh, that if there is a problem you sit together you you do something for the IU relationship and then you will find a solution. This was a bank that did not earn so much money. This is why this bank was bought by the other bank. The other bank had more, uh, we want to reach a goal, we want to uh, earn our money kind of system. And a relationship is not interesting if it's not on a, it, a U, I, U, it level serving that goal. And, and this um, was part of the whole culture of the company. And then these two companies have been merged. And maybe in each country, in, in the uh, Vereinsbank, there have been a lot of IU people who felt not very good. And now they met people of the other side and they could merge very fine and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But in total, also the procedures of what to do when we are, have a conflict. The one say we set goals, we have two hours, who's going with the goal is in, the others are out. Uh, if the same event is organized by the hypobanks, they say let's sit together, let's talk who we are, what needs we have, uh, how we can have a good atmosphere, and if that is built up, what can we reach then? And certainly this produced a lot of problems. And uh, the stereotype views about each other as a whole company or uh, um, a section in the company had a lot to do uh, with his uh, relationship preference styles. And, you know, and, and when they have been taught on that, they at least had a concept for a meta stance if they found themselves being involved in polarizing processes. <coughs> and that's a lot for such a small concept. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, it is. I think this has become, uh, this is part of the problematic culture within TA because the professed tenet of mm -hmm. TA is IU, mm -hmm. intimacy. This is the goal. Eric Byrne was clearly I it. Yes. Um, and there has been a divide all, yeah. all the way through the yeah. history of TA. Yeah. And I think in part that's also a divide between the fields. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, we could explain some in the light of this concept. Some, yeah. And as a professional goal for when we train professionals is to understand what's the basic logic of dealing with the relationship in these terms uh, is on the other side. And then to know how to connect with this other style. Also, I have still certainly my preferences and I stay with my preference, but I can learn not to put down the other preference and find a way to bridge the two style. So that, and after a while you find out it's not polar. Certainly the I it person is also a IU person or in, in a different context, maybe primarily a IU person. And the IU person is certainly is not only interested in IU, it's interested in I it when the IU level is satisfactory. And so the uh, they can um uh um, support each other with their, with their preferences and from a perspective of becoming an integrated individual it's, okay, it's important that you stay with your preferences and integrate of the other preferences enough that you that it's giving together a whole okay? that's a Jungian idea you integrate non-lift sides. Jung said um, a good life is not a perfect life, but it's a life that is integrated, integrating all aspects of life, that you are full of life then, not that you optimize your preferences. So this was the third piece. Did that come over? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's easy, easy to understand. No? And I already told you um, that, for example, with my colleague uh, Angelika Glöckner, I don't know if some of you know them, she's, she's also a TA teacher, and she's a person, whenever she's touched and stimulated and things get essential for her, she's creating a lot of movement. And when I'm touched, I'm closing down distractions and I get very calm and for years we had problems when she was and we have been friends and when she wanted to tell me something what is very essential she talked so loud that I always call her poor <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't understand uh, that I do not react to her essentials uh, and do not get excited about it because she's in her frame of reference if something is important you have to get excited yeah. and if you get excited it gets even more importance for you and she didn't understand that my frame of reference is different I'm functioning different and when I want to tell her something that is essential to me she say yeah somehow that sounds good could you say it more clearly to me <laughs> The excitement is missing for her. Yeah. And so it, a difference that really often makes a difference is finding out whether an excitement intensifier or an in excitement diminisher is going together. And if there are two excitement diminisher, mm -hmm. this could be very thoughtful or very boring. And if two excitement intensifier come together, this could be very vivid and 
uh, essential, but it could also be just excitement and getting totally superficial. So none of these preferences uh, only has benefits. So each style um, can be has its area where it is useful and an area where it's not useful. So if you really want to understand something that has a calm quality and you try to understand it by making it more excited, you just miss the quality. So it's important, again, to enlarge your range in which you feel comfortable with and to understand that you, for perceiving and sharing specific atmospheres and paths of reality, you have to tune into the range that can connect to this reality. And when you have habitually, when you feel it's not, it's not essential enough, and you should be more calm to connect, but instead habitually you make it more intensive to connect, then you lose it more. And that's the way you, for example, you can describe hurry up. I think hurry up has a lot to do with, with being hungry for essence and life. But going into the wrong direction to find it, and in this direction you lose it. And you go into a circle, a vicious circle, like that. And there has been a, um, a, um, a psilocybin, a researcher, Roland Fischer, who in the 70s at the lecture uh, lectured about this model and he said uh, it's a normal range, these are the normal normal phrenics he calls them <laughs> and in the normal range uh, everybody uh, somehow stays within uh, usual categories and if you want to go into new fields and new categories you have to leave as is normal range into the one or the other direction yeah. and then you get confused excited or thoughtful irritated not knowing how to react each one in his or her style and both are ways to come to high level spirituality the excitement intensifier may end up in Sufi dancing or dynamic meditations with Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh and the excitement diminisher may end up in sitting without content and without dynamic and then being total essence and b both are ways to come to a high connection with dimensions of essence. So it's not the one or the other is wrong, but it's important to find out which dynamic, how they can meet and work together, and which dynamic to activate when for what. And very often people, if they want to make their life richer, they look for new fields, new topics, new connections, and I help them to understand that you have to develop more modes to connect with the life they, they already have, because they experience more dimensions in that life, instead of going into other life paths and having the same old dimensions over there. So, much of the work I do has to do with helping people to change how, not to change what. This is really interesting on an organisational level, mm -hmm. thinking about some senior leaders who mm -hmm. I've experienced who have been very excited about a new vision, a new way of working in the organisation, yeah. and have had nothing on the teams. And they suddenly start singing, dancing, jazz hands, anything to get people excited. <laughs> yeah. And it generates even less yeah. Yeah. And it's because of this, it's, it's not because these people aren't excited. Yeah, and it's good to tell them it's okay that you want to make people essential, mm. but making them excited is for some good, mm. and for some uh, topics good, 
but not for everyone. And so by this reframing, they might understand, oh, I just projected my way, also my negative habitual way to get more essentiality uh, to the organization. And they don't have to turn up the volume on their intensifying Right. Or diminishing. It's right. About being a so they need to enlarge their understanding on yeah. how they can lead an organization to more essential work, and what how they have to change uh, to change to connect with it and, uh, and inspire them. Yeah. This has helped me to see a piece of work I did several years ago in a different light, which was um, I was asked to do. Uh, presentation on career progression mm -hmm. to different groups and I worked up something where I could work with what was in the room Yeah. and I had a room of librarians <laughs> for one of it and I realised now they were excited and dis diminishes because yeah. when I started working I thought gosh I'm going to have to do something very different here so I, yeah. I created lots of spaces where half the time they didn't really say very much at all they worked in pairs and there was lots of stillness but it felt very very alive mm -hmm. and the feedback was low key um and then i worked with another group from the health service and, Whoa! And, I, and i had to get them all into much bigger groups and, and i was much more active because i'm on the intensified right. not that you've noticed or anything yeah. and um that that i can see that as, as being very useful mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. because the discount that was present in the with the librarian group within the person who commissioned the work mm -hmm. was that they weren't showing enough enthusiasm about career right. progression. They weren't engaged in the yeah. same way that this other group were. Yeah. And that's not true. Right. That wasn't my experience, but I didn't have the language for it. Right. Mm. Uh, what I think is really fascinating about this, it's really helping me understand something about myself. So I think there's a... Um, I see a lot around me people getting more interested in things like yoga and meditation and more kind of spiritual holidays. And I've tried it. And I, do, I, I like to go for a run. Mm -hmm. And I feel really connected with myself when I'm really mm -hmm. on a long, yeah. active run. And the first time I can, I'm, I'm now thinking, yeah, that's all right, because I'm feeling like mm -hmm. I've kind of um, told myself that that's wrong, but actually it's right for me. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel really yeah. alive. I don't feel alive. Yeah, it's, yet, on, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's only wrong if you would expect everybody yeah. is that kind. Mm. And yet there are there are contexts when I think I'm quite excitement diminishing. I can't say the word. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I think for me, yeah, in different contexts. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this is, different. Yeah. yeah, I explained it very, yeah. very generally. Certainly, it can be differentiated a lot, yeah. right? And it, it's all. Uh, for example, uh, I'm a type. Sometimes I, uh, I can be work on a high excitement level, and then it's good. But then later on, uh, uh, I go back to a too quiet level. Yeah. So it's. I do not find a good balance in that, but I know what it is about. Yeah. I observed with my, my clients uh, about those dimensions and several other dimensions too, that people have a, a, a preference and at certain moments of life they want to expand what does it mean to be different and to act dif to, yeah. to behave differently and to broaden the, the, the scope and uh, have more resources to do. To, to to use, but when they have a problem or when they have a, um, they are, for instance, physically ill, mm -hmm. they have a tendency to go back to the, 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 the original style. Yes. Mm -hmm. And certainly, when you look at a company or uh, if it's a company that is in a very uh, excitement intensifying market. Uh, then they should be able at least to connect to it, otherwise they cannot make business in that market. And uh, without saying somebody is wrong, you sh should have enough people who feel comfortable and un will not get exhausted on a high intensive level. If you push excitement diminisher up to being uh, excitement intensifier, this, even if it's possible, it drives them into a burnout. Mm. And vice versa, if you 
want to have people calm, who come to essence by excitement, they may try to do so, but, but they should just get born stubborn, non-creative. Mm. So, if you have a cat or you have a dog, you have just have to have ex to expect different things. A cat never will bring you your stick, your throw away. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's a bad cat. Mm. There was an article, even just within the last ten days, on the BBC website. Somebody had done some research into kind of well-being, mm -hmm. and they decided actually stress stress is really good for you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I agreed everything with everything he said, but I think there's a link. Yeah. Because there were lots of people he spoke to that were saying, actually, the high levels of energy and long hours, they're keeping me alive, actually. They're not burning me out, mm. they're keeping me alive. Yeah. Both can be ways uh, to enlightenment, but both also can yeah. uh, be ways to addiction. Mm. 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 I'm thinking about my brother who... Um, works in a bank and is uh, in risk management. Yeah. He has to, he gets an enormous amount of holiday a year. And at one point in the year he has to take a minimum of three weeks. And quite often I'll talk to him about it and he's like, he's like, yeah, I really like it, but it's a long time. Mm -hmm. But actually it kind of keeps him in that normal range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, uh, there's another concept I've not written down here. I call that the recovery uh, depression. If somebody uh, is working too long on a too high level, too high level, his, the batteries are discharged, and when they go into holidays, they just have to pay for some of it by depression. But this depression doesn't say you are doing something wrong. Right now, the depression is saying, before you lift over your energy limit, and now you have to pay for it. And it's okay not to cure that. It's okay to find ways um, to deal with it in a good, good way until your batteries are full enough that you can more recover from your, uh, out of your own dynamic. And many people die. Uh, uh, not not when they are in higher stress, but when they try to relax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, a dangerous procedure. If you have a, a overstressed manager, don't tell him just to relax and go to holidays. You will, mm -hmm. so you, it's important to mm -hmm. cope with the bridge mm -hmm. and go through the way uh, with with the person through the way um, through a recovery depression. But not misdiagnosing it. Mm -hmm. I, I look at it a bit like um, a hundred meter runner. They don't run a hundred meters and yeah. stop. They yeah. slow down. <laughs> yeah. They do a lap to slow down and yeah. then stop. Okay. Yeah. And it's a bit like that whole stopping. In my industry, a lot of people get ill, colds, mm -hmm. flu, mm -hmm. and they stop mm -hmm. holidays and stuff. Yeah. My um, my German godfather always said to me that. English have got it wrong, they only ever take one week holiday. Yeah. But you've got to take three weeks holiday every time. The first week to get over work, the second week to prepare yourself for the holiday, and the third week to have your holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, most parts of the world have a different style. On that. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese, uh, well, in Asia, they yeah, have five days holidays, and they fly six hours <laughs> to come to their goal, and they sit on a boat and eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> and they call this holiday. <laughs> okay, so these have been the four small pieces of personality concepts. And I don't know how to connect this with ego states. <laughs> I would connect this with um, hungers, stimulus hunger. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Good idea. And, and I think Gene Elsley Clark does something around this. Too much, too mm -hmm. yeah, just ah, right. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and the dumbbells is in mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let's have a break for 10 minutes. Oh. Shorter one. Starting off long, getting shorter. <laughs> yeah. Kissing more like me. Getting more like me. At 4 o'clock, you will have a long break. <laughs>